Uh, if you have your Bibles, turn over to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4, and we're going to start in verse 17. And as we do, let's pray. Lord, we come before you in the name of Jesus. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that you sent to be our comforter, our helper, to be our leader. Lord, we thank you uh, uh, for the forgiveness of sins. Lord God, for the ministry of reconciliation. Lord, we thank you um, that uh, you created us in your image to glorify you in everything we say, everything we do. Lord God, we give this evening to you. And we say, have your way in us, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17, the Apostle Paul writes this. He says, uh, this I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being who, being past feeling, have given themselves over to lewdness, to work of all uncleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned, but you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Tonight I want to talk about being a brand new man. Can you say amen? amen. In Christ we're brand new. We're, new. we're born again, new creation realities in Jesus Christ. And God's called us out of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of his dear son, the kingdom of light, for a purpose and for a reason. And the Apostle Paul is reminding the Ephesian church here uh, that uh, I say, therefore, back to verse 17, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind. We, each and every one of us have a testimony. Can you say amen? amen? We have a story to tell. We have a story to share of what Jesus has done in my life. You want to start evangelizing, reaching the lost, reaching your family members that are far from Christ, just start telling your story. Like, where do you start? At the beginning. All stories start in the beginning. Can you say amen? When it started out, this is who I was before I knew Christ. And if they knew you before Christ, you have a testimony. And this is what he did for me. This is what he did in me. This is what he did through me. He's made me more than a conqueror because greater is he who's in me than he that's in the wor world. So that we give testimony of God's goodness, of God's grace, of God's mercy, of his forgiveness, of his restoration, of his reconciliation. And we are able, because we have the living hope inside of us through that testimony, we're able to give somebody else hope in the middle of darkness. Can you say amen? Amen. And we testify in the Lord. We didn't do this in and of ourselves. Amen. Can you say amen? I know people that are highly motivated, highly competent, very organized, very disciplined, and outside of Christ, when they die, they will split hell wide open. Can you say amen? That's the truth. We do not make it through this life by sheer willpower alone, by our own internal constitution. We make it through this life because of the testimony of what Jesus has done inside of us, through us, by his grace. And the Apostle Paul's reminding us that this testimony is in Christ, and that we should testify of the Lord. And part of that is, is to no longer walk according to the way of this world. As the rest of the Gentiles walk, in the futility of their mind. Have you not seen over these last X number of years, some that have lived longer, 50 years. Some that have lived longer, 60 years, 30 years, 20 years, 10 years, five years, the last three years, this world has lost its mind. Where good is called evil and evil is called good. Can you say amen? That like the most offensive thing that a person can be in this generation is intolerant. Can you say amen? That's the way the futility of this world's 
minds thinks, and a lot of Christians are getting caught up into the spirit of this world, and it hits on what Pastor Jim was hitting on the, this last Sunday morning, what Gabe hit on Sunday morning, the cares of this world, the lust for other things, the deceitfulness of riches. It becomes the spirit of this world, which is a counterfeit to the Holy Spirit that Jesus sent for us and wants to do a work in us. Can you say amen? We're to no longer conduct ourselves as to the pattern of this world. So as a Christian, I can look at the course of this world and go, whatever that is, probably the opposite is getting me closer to Jesus. Like if I just do the opposite of what the world's doing, I'm probably going to get closer to Jesus. Where the world is about divide, 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 divide. Divide among gender. Divide among ages. Divide among socioeconomic status, educational level, um, professional competency, um, personality traits. We divide, divide, divide. We, we get everybody into these little cloistered tribes of, I just want to be around, around skin color. And all these things that are like, drives me bonkers because in Christ we're to endeavor to keep a spirit of unity in the bond of peace that Christ becomes the one that brings us all together. One of the most offensive things happened to me in the back of the church here. It was probably five years ago. And uh, someone who was coming to church here uh, pulled me up as I was in the back office there and said, hey, I'm, I'm getting ready to invite my friend to church, co-worker. I'm like, fantastic, we should invite our friends to church. Church is a good place. We grow in community, love, knowledge. Uh, we, we grow in the grace and knowledge of God. It's a great, and I think Victorious Life Church is a great church for somebody to be a part of to grow in their walk with Jesus. Would love to have your friend. And then, then they say, well, they're, they're not white, they're black. And I go, and I go, What? Oh, well, you mean you would think that they're not welcome because they don't look like me? And, and, and a, part of, a part of me, because I'm very reflective when, when somebody says something wonky, because I, I take a look inside before I look outside. And I go like, have I done anything in my life publicly in the church that would somehow insinuate that, that I would be discriminatory based on the color of somebody's skin like like have you not seen my daughter who runs through this church who's biracial have you not seen our other pastors kids who are biracial have you not seen uh, the drummers the singers the the various other people and how like how would how would that thought enter into their mind and a lot of it was because there's a spirit of this world that says everybody just stay in their own place. With, and I'm going like, you know what? Christ died so that that middle wall of partition could be broken down so that we could all become free in him. And that's, that's thinking along the futility of mind that the Gentiles think that the people of this world think that somehow if they accumulate power or they accumulate influence or they accumulate followers, somehow they, they're, they're able to uh, usher in their new world order. Well, let me say this. All the kingdoms of this world are going to be washed away. I mean, I'm reminded in the book of Daniel of Nebuchadnezzar who had, he had his dream of his great monument. You remember that dream that he had? And that he was at the top as the gold, and there was um, a chest of silver, and I might get it wrong, and there were legs of bronze, and, and, but at the bottom there were feet mixed with, with uh, uh, metal and clay. And, and he was, there's a part of Nebuchadnezzar where he's like, I, the Babylon the Great, we're, we're above, and, and we knew of, 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 the, of the Persians, and and, and the Grecian Empire, and then the two legs of iron, they were two legs of iron, I believe, and they were, it's been a while since I'd gone back and studied that, and they're, they're representing the Roman Empire, and, and we, we look at these, and even though we, I love America, can you say amen? Amen, amen. It's, it's just, regardless of what the politics are because of the people, and the people of God, America is the greatest nation in the world, 
I mean, we have an enduring constitution for nearly 250 years. No other na current nation holds a candle to what, we've, what we have here in America. And, and may God shed his grace on thee. Can you say amen? amen? And it's the people of God who are the restraining force that's keeping things. We think it's bad here. Like, get to know some of the miss missionaries down in Oaxaca, Mexico, where, and I've heard Sister Penny testify, but like, where you got like literal witches on the outside casting spells into the missionary base. Like, not just, we call them protesters in the United States. Everywhere else they call them witches and warlocks. Just saying. But, but we have it blessed here in the United States. But this is what I know. That, that dream is going to be fulfilled because there's going to be a rock that's carved out, not carved out by human hands. And that's the rock Christ Jesus. And that rock is going to strike that statue representing the empires of the ages. And that statue is going to come down and be ground into dust. And it's going to blow away and disappear just as we had a rain last night. Less than 24 hours, I don't see much evidence of rain. When I walk, I feel the humidity. <laughs> but we don't really see the residue of the rain. So if, you, if somebody woke up at 6 o'clock this evening and you said it rained, they'd go, really? Like, I don't, I don't even recall. Well, there's going to become a time where where we're in that millennial reign of Jesus, where we're in that, in, in, in the new Jerusalem and, and, and the empires of this world are going to be like, oh, did, we, did we as a people do that? Like, did, were there actually kings and dictators and presidents and prime ministers that thought they could rise up against Jesus, who is King of kings and Lord of lords. That's where the futility of the mind of this world leads people to nod. And, and those of us that are followers of Jesus, we have, to, we have to insulate ourselves by the power of the Holy Spirit with the word of God from adopting that mindset. Can you say amen? And I, I do not want to ever be a culturally conforming Christian. Can you say Amen to where I'm only a Christian in ritual and, and outward action only, but I don't just want the law, but I want the spirit of the law and I want the circumcision to be on my heart and to be that one where it's fulfilled out of, out of I believe it's in Jeremiah, where God's speaking to his people where he's going, there's kind of come a day where I'm not just gonna write my word on tablets of stone, but I wanna write them on your heart. This world has lost its mind. And the Apostle Paul's writing this years ago going, he already told us the world has this, the futility of their mind. It's nothingness. They have an understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God. I, I, I've followed over the last several years some of the new atheist movement out there. That's, that's, they, they, they tried to come to a conclusion that man is going to rise above where it's at if we, just, if we just harness the power of logic and reason. And if everybody was logical and reason and use the power of logic and reason, we'll somehow overcome these archaic uh, religious beliefs. Guys writing bestsellers. Invited to all the podcasts. And I heard their arguments early. And I followed them to this day. And most of them now are disillusioned. Because they realize that human beings are really, we aren't that logical. Can you say amen? <laughs> and number two, they're God of reason. He's powerless compared to the God of the universe. And a lot of them now have switched over to Buddhist meditation in a, a transcendental state because they've been disillusioned because the God they created in their image has failed them. That's why God warns in the opening of the Ten Commandments that we shall have no other gods before him. That we're not to make any 
graven image. Because if we form a God in our image and it disappoints us, we just cancel it and we create a new God. Little G-O-D God. Can you say amen? And, and we think this, that, that it, the futility of the mind of this world is like we went from, from traditional marriage to hookup, shack up, break up culture. Can you say amen? Like, it's real. And then it's like, well, well, the slippery slope really doesn't exist. Well, let me tell you, the slippery slope exists. And you get away from traditional marriage to hookup, shack up, break up culture, which starts to redefine marriage in a generation. To, well, if we've redefined it this far, that we can be married in our heart, but not married on paper. I don't know if any of you have heard somebody say that before. I had a coworker that said, well, me and my, me and my, me and my girl, like, we've been together for 12 years and we have three kids. It, it, I'm like, why not me? Why not get married? Well, it's, it's just a piece of paper. And my, this was a time where my, my mind was sharp. And I was able to come with a good retort. I was like, well, if the paper's so meaningless to you, then why not do it? If it means so little, then why not do it? Because the thing is, it had nothing to do with the piece of paper. It had to do with the condition of the heart. So we'd redefine marriage in that way. And then by the early 90s, mid-90s, we're defining marriage again through the 90s and should we have same-sex unions be recognized by the state and then start to certain denominations say well you have to perform these these ceremonies and it was a slippery slope and then the gay rights movement moved into this trans rights movement that we're all encountered with on a regular basis. And I, I've been trying to pay attention, but it hurts my heart. And especially it hurts my heart for our young people that, are, that don't have a lot of really good examples of marriage in their lives. Can you say amen? And it reverberates. And it's important. And covenant is important. Can you say amen? And it, it, it's a futility of the mind of this world. They have their understanding darkened. Which means, like even when we talk about things of the Bible, even when I bring up something like, well, if it's just a piece of paper, enter into marriage, the guy's mind is darkened does not comprehend. Being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of the, their heart. People are ignorant. Can you say amen? amen. I encounter a few of them occasionally. Every once in a while, I'm the ignorant one. But there's a couple times of there's a couple ways of ignorance. Number one way is just not knowing, being unaware. Like, I, n nobody told me that. And now that I know, I won't do that anymore. Like, there, there's a part of that. There's also a part of ignorance of just burying your head in the sand and pretending like it's all going to go away and get better. Well, the course of this world is not going to get better as the years go on because prophecy must be fulfilled. Can you say amen? Jesus is coming again soon. Jesus said that, that the end days, the end times will be like as if in the days of Noah. The days of Noah, the Bible tells us that every thought and intent of the heart of man was evil. That's not good. But let me say this, because of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit-filled church, the Christian who's following Jesus, we do not have to go the way of the world. 
<sighs> Hallelujah. Let's go to verse 19. Who, being past feeling, have given themselves over lewdness to the work of all uncleanness with greediness. The people of this world just dive right in and just like, well, if this is the way it's going to be, if I'm going to get on the hedonistic track, then I might as well just jump in, go full gusto up. The wages of sin is death. Whether, whether you're in Christ or outside of Christ, the wages of sin is still death. Let's go on to verse 20. But you have not so learned Christ. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you do what? You put off concerning the former conduct. That means in this, as we're following Jesus, the Apostle Paul's writing to the Ephesian church and he's telling them like, you in and of yourselves, you have two ways that you conduct yourselves. If we look at it as, as a conductor of the train, the conductor of the train gets to pick which track it's going to go on. We get to conduct. We've been given the free will. We've been given the power to choose. We've been given the right to choose. And Jesus tells us the answers to the test. Choose the way, the truth, and the life. Choose freedom in the Son. Choose, choose you this day whom you'll serve. That God set life and death before us. We get to choose. That you put off the former conduct. So that means inside of me, inside of each and every one of us, is the conduct that wants to glorify Christ in everything we say and everything we do. But there's also a part of us, an unregenerate part, that we're to mortify the deeds of the flesh. That you know what? He wants to get his say occasionally too. And start to conduct himself. I call that guy my inner jerk. He comes out sometimes loud and proud. He's, he's the me when I'm frustrated, irritated, temperamental, when I haven't eaten, when my blo blood sugar is low, when I've, put, I've had all that I could stand and I can't stand no more and I'm just fed up with it and ready to go like, oh, you think I'm mean like this, I'll show you mean. And then you go full bore, conduct yourselves according to the old man and your wife and your kids have eyes that look like saucers and they go, we didn't think that guy was still there. <laughs> He's there less today than he was a few years ago, but occasionally he emerges. And the thing is, that's conducting my way according to the old way, but Christ has set me free so I can conduct myself in a better way. And some of you that are super sweet and always positive and just like you're, you, don't, you don't understand. Be thankful you don't understand. But the, but the part of this is, is that we're to put off that old guy. We're to take him off. That old guy is dead in Christ, but he still wants to live inside of us. That you put off concerning your former conduct. That means who we were before, we have to count that person dead in Christ. It's almost as if like, oh, that's my evil twin. I kind of recognize him. He looks a lot like me, sounds a lot like me, talks a lot like me, may occasionally gets mistaken for me, but that guy I'm trying to get rid of so that I can do what? That I can put on the new man. The old man which follows, the, uh, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust. What's the, what's the deceit of lust? That if I get it, somehow I'm going to be satisfied. That's the deceit of lust. The thing is, is when you lust after something and you obtain it, all it does is stoke the desire for what? More. 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 The deceit of lust is that somehow that thing will satisfy. Somehow that person will satisfy. Somehow that goal will, will complete. Somehow it becomes this, this negative feedback loop that propels people forward in the deceitfulness of lust. That if I, if I just... If I just make more money, I'll be happier. Now, what I say, like, I've, 
if if you any of you that's known me for for decades, like I grew up poor. We were poor. We were poor as kids, and there was famine and there was feast. There were good times, and there were bad times. And I've lived. I've never had a super abundance, but I definitely know what it's been like to live without. And let me just say this. It's much more comfortable to live with a little bit of something than a whole lot of nothing. Just saying. Just saying. But be, just because it's more comfortable to live with a little bit of something than a whole lot of nothing doesn't mean growing that pile bigger is somehow going to satisfy that much more. It becomes a lust that if I can work enough hours, do enough projects, burn the candle at both ends, like, great, you're, you're really good at working 80 hours a week, but you only get to live till 55 because you used up all your miles. What a trade-off. You built up this pile that, of achievement that you don't get to enjoy for your life. Isn't, more, isn't life more than the place we live, the food we eat, than the money we earn? Isn't, isn't it what, we, what was reminded of us this last Sunday morning, that the kingdom of God is, is not in food or drink, but it's righteousness and peace in the Holy Ghost, that, that it's, it's the Father's good pleasure to give to us the kingdom, that to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things. And, and when we put the kingdom first, all these other things take care of themselves. Because the old man, all he wants is more, 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 more. That if my checkbook balances, if I have all the streaming services, if I'm caught up on all my shows, I can do this, I can, that somehow I'm going to be satisfied and we end up in a loop of deceit because we're lusting after things that are never going to satisfy. But in Christ, I'm always satisfied. That you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. The, the being renewed in the spirit of your mind is, is not some passive activity where you just veg out on the couch and quit thinking about the things of the world. Being renewed in the spirit of your mind is like, I am going to dive into the word of God. I'm going to surround myself with the right affirmations, the right saying. I'm going to set my environment with intentionality that's going to change something. And I'm going to change the way my mind thinks and my mind functions. Can you say amen? This is, a, this is one of the, with my wife and I, we did foster care. One of the things that we got to go through uh, which I just dove headlong into because it allowed me to nerd out to the nth degree. Like when I find a topic, I jump headlong into it and I want to know, I don't just want to know what people think about it. I want to know like what the, what the researchers found. And this is what they found out is that uh, the human brain isn't fully developed until between the ages of 21 and 24. So when you have teenagers and you're like, <laughs> like you're acting like you don't have a brain. It's true because they're at least missing half of their brain. Um, <laughs> it's like that's why when you're 16, you think you know everything. And when you turn 28, you find out that your mom and dad already knew everything. <laughs> like your mom and dad were way smarter. Now, my mom and dad way smarter now that I'm 42 than when I was 16 years old. Just saying. But, what, but the thing is about the human brain and development is, is, is the full development isn't until we're in our early 20s, but the majority of your brain growth occurs between the ages of, of concept, between ages, between conception and four years old. So how, how we interact with infants and our young ones is, is critical to their brain development. Can you say amen? And Sister Mary's an expert on this, and she's seen it, she's seen it to the positive, and she's seen it for the negative as well in what she was, what she was engaged in professionally. And as your brain develops, it starts, it's really just a bunch of salt and fat is what the brain is and water. 
but there's these neurons that are in there and they fire and these synapses go off and, and as you start to think a certain pattern, these little pathways in your brain start forming. And those, and if, if it's a high stress environment, people get real sensitive to stress. If it's a, a more peaceful environment, they, it, they're more adaptive. Can you say amen? Um, the, what, the way the brain pathways function is this, is it works a lot like water where water always follows the path of least resistance, right? Water's always gonna run downhill, path, that's why the river goes where it goes, it's the path of least resistance. Whereas our brain is forming these, these synapses and, and thought patterns, our brain will start to follow a thought pattern that follows the path of least resistance. And it's been, doc it's, Pastor, am I not telling the truth? Mary, telling the truth. This is like, this isn't just Craig sitting on, watching these YouTube experts <laughs> spouting off. Well, here's the thing. If, we've, if we develop a certain thought pattern over time, it takes a lot of work to undo that thought pattern and change it. Our views on, have you ever like really tried to change somebody's mind? How successful have you been at changing somebody's mind? Like, like even when you just lay it out, logically, makes sense, this is the way it should be, and they'll smile and nod and agree with you and go back to a, a thought pattern. I mean, it's, it's, it's what we know that with our kids. We know that with our spouse. One of the hardest person's mind to change is your spouse's mind. That's why you live together and, and you work on things together. Instead of always work, worrying about changing everybody else's mind, the Bible's telling us to change our mind. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that means we have to intentionally start, like there are certain patterns of thought where if we've gone down, especially as a teenager, as someone in our 20s, some, something as an adolescence that, that start to reinforce things, and it takes intentionality, a focused effort and time in the Word of God, around the Word of God, to start to th see things differently. Can you say amen? And this is the thing, it's like our, it's like our diets, that we get like really good results in the first two weeks and then we don't see many results for a while. And then we get discouraged and we go back to what we were doing that got us into the place and got us back to the first place. Can you say amen? You guys have all been there before. I've been there before more times than I can count. The, the successful diets isn't this or this. Or, the successful diet is the one that you integrate as a lifestyle that just becomes what you do on a daily basis. That makes tons of logical sense, doesn't it? But many of us are going to go home and do illogical things with our diet tonight. Just saying. So, well, that means we have to resist the old man that wants to think a certain way, and the way we combat it is to renew our mind according to the Word of God. Thy Word, I've hid it in my heart that I might not sin against you. Your Word is a light into my, or, yeah, a lamp to my feet and a light into my path. I'll meditate on this word. You know, I, blessed is the man who walks down the council on the godly or sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And, and in it, he meditates day and night. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast, a right spirit inside of me. I mean, the, these, are, these aren't just catchy cliches that we surround ourselves with that look good on coffee cuffs, but they're biblical truths that reshape our thought pattern. That when we meditate on words like, like Psalm 139, that I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. How beautiful are your works. That before I had any days, God wrote them all out for me. And all of a sudden, if you meditate on those scriptures, all of a sudden you have a new appreciation for life and blessing. Can you say amen? And, and it doesn't just happen overnight. And we don't always see immediate results. But what I do know is, is that adopting a, 
adopting a lifestyle of renewing our minds according to the word of God, putting off the old man, pays dividends. Sometimes we don't see the rewards of that for years or even decades later. That's the hard part. It's because we got to do the hard work today for a better future tomorrow. Amen. But living it out for years, it is so worth it. Are you getting things out of this this evening? And be renewed in the spirit of your mind that you, to verse 24, that you, put off, that you put on the new man, which is created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. We could go on um, and read verse 25 further, but I'll let you guys read that in your times this week. 2 Corinthians 5 and 17, you can turn over there real quick. You'll hear this scripture quoted from this pulpit often. Probably, probably three or four times a month. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ... How do I know that I'm in Christ? You made a public profession of faith that Jesus is Lord. That's the beginning. Do you believe that God raised him from the dead on the third day? That he forgives you of your sins? Washes you white as snow? Clean? Cleansed? Reconciled to God? In Christ? Public profession of faith? In Jesus. That's how you know you're in Christ. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Brand new. A brand new man. Well, I don't feel like I'm new. Well, here's the truth. We don't walk by our feelings. We walk by sight. of my current condition. The Bible says that guess whose truth outranks my truth? This truth outranks my truth. Well, do you know what I did today? <sighs> yes, you conducted yourself according to the conduct of the old man. So what's the Bible say? You put off that guy. You mortify the deeds of the flesh. You renew the spirit of your mind. And you dive back into this verse and go, you know what? That's not who I am because I'm a saint of God. I'm a new creation in Christ. I don't act like that anymore. But what if I do it again? I don't act like that anymore. Those words do not come out of my mouth. Well, what about when I'm angry? Those words don't come. But don't you know I'm Italian or German or Hispanic or I was raised in the trailer park? Like... Those words don't come out my mouth. Well, what if they do come out? <sighs> Being renewed in the spirit of my mind, and those words aren't coming out my mouth. I'm putting a guard. God put it, my daughter reminded me of this in the psalm that she was reading this last week. God put a guard over my mouth. So I don't say dumb things. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. All things passed away. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things. All things have become new. Those old things are dead. Can you say amen? <sighs> Jesus is the one. The Holy Spirit is the one who is the one who needs to bring life and resurrect things that have died from the dead. We, if there's things that Christ has killed in our lives, we need to let them stay dead. And he's saying this conduct, these thought patterns, this way of thinking, these, this generational, whatever, however, we all have, we all have the baggage that, we, that we've inherited, adopted, grabbed a hold of. Uh, I think Pastor Jim preached a sermon here. This has been decades ago on the barnacles of life that attach them. Do you remember that sermon, Pastor? 
where the barnacles that attach themselves to the bottom of a ship. And, and if that ship isn't maintained and cleaned on a regular basis, it's, it's not going to go through the water as efficiently or as effectively. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to rot from the inside out because it's got all these barnacles and all these parasites that have attached themselves to it. And, and, and the power of the Holy Spirit goes in and scrapes those barnacles off the whole of our life. And these rough spots, we've all, we all have them. And if we had time, time or the capability to, we could all give a testimony of the barnacles of our life. We've all got them. Even the person that you think has everything together, you'd be, you'd be amazed at the pain that they've experienced because of life. Because not everybody has a big mouth like I do and tells on themselves all the time. <laughs> you'd, you'd be surprised. What you'd also do is you'd also be humbled. Because you go, oh, they went through all that. And they're still nice. Like if somebody treated me like that or did those things to me, like... I'd either never leave my house or I'd be the crankiest old guy out there. The meanest person around. If I had, if I knew, and there's people that, that give great hugs and huge smiles and are servants and helpful, not because of what they've been through in life, but because of what Christ has done on the inside of them. Can you say amen? amen? Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. It's always exciting when you get something new. Can you say amen? amen. Like, I love, one of my favorite smells, I love a new car smell. Like some of you may think, Ugh, I like a new car smell. In fact, when I buy stuff that makes my truck smell good, I want my truck to smell like a new car because I like it that much because I want something new. I've never had a brand new vehicle. I will never get a brand new vehicle. I get very few things. I, I got a brand new phone this last week. No scratches on the case. No cracks in the screen. No water damage. And I was, was pretty excited because my old phone died. And it's going to get sent away tomorrow not to come back to life. But the thing is, is we can lament. We can either keep trying to bring up the things that Christ has killed in our lives. Or we can appreciate the newness of life that he's given us. Sometimes we got to let the dead bury the dead and let it stay dead. And go, you know what? That's dead in Christ. That old way of thinking, that's dead in Christ. That mistake, dead in Christ. That bad decision, dead in Christ. That habit, that addiction, that mindset, that's dead. That, rela that toxic relationship, it's dead because i got to start living out of the new life. And the new life is the abundant life. And the new life is the blessed life. And just because it's an abundant life and a new life and a blessed life doesn't mean that it's void from pain or suffering or consternation or tribulation. It's not free from burdens. But what it means is the new life is, is that in spite of tribulations, pressures, challenges, have Christ on my side. Have the power of the Holy Spirit that's working his way in me and through me. That he who began a good work in me is going to complete it until the day of Christ. Because I'm his workmanship. I'm, I'm his masterpiece. And he's not finished with me yet. And I may get frustrated that I think I should be further along, but, but I'm, I'm running the race that he's called me to run. And sometimes the pace that I'm running is quick, and other times it's just a light jog, but I'm still running his race because I'm a brand new man and I'm not running out of my own strength anymore, but I'm running 
because of the grace and mercy of God. It, it, and it's a shift of mindset, a power of revelation that brings transformation in our lives. Can you say amen? Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Galatians 6 and 15, the Apostle Paul writes, For in Christ neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything, but it's a new creation. It, it, Pastor Jim and I were talking about this this morning with the craziness that's happening in the world today that you have young people that are departing from the faith and they're adopting two different extremes of faith. Either they're going way back to this hyper-ritualistic uh, liturgical style or they're embracing this free form, anything goes. And a lot of folks have just abandoned the true church. Can you say amen? The, 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 the true Jesus-following spirit-filled Holy Ghost Church. And I'm not just talking, I'm not talking to a denomination or I'm talking about those that are passionately pursuing Christ, living out the new life the best we can on a daily basis. Those, that's, that's important. Can you say amen? And it's not about the circumcision or the uncircumcision. Or, and even, even in modern movements, even movement today, is we have a lot of people that want to bring back the law and start following all the ceremonial law and civic law. Let me just say this. The moral law of God stands. Can you say amen? Jesus fulfilled the ceremonial law. Our covenant is not built on the blood of goats and bulls and rams and lambs. But the covenant that we have is based on the blood of Jesus Christ, a new covenant with, with better promises. That every, every March, April, we're not, we're not going through our house and, and cleaning it from top to bottom to get rid of all the leaven in our house. Like that week, I'm probably, if we're serving ham, we're probably eating rolls. And they're not flat rolls. They're full rolls. And if I'm going to eat rolls, they're going to be Hawaiian rolls, the sweet ones with lots of butter on them because I want them to taste good. Just saying. But we're not do, we don't do that. Why? Because, because Christ is our Passover lamb. And he fulfilled that. That he fulfills Pentecost as he sends the Holy Spirit. That Jesus is the full atonement for sin on the day of atonement. That Jesus, Jesus is our jubilee. See, the Jews had to wait 50 years. They had to wait a generation before they could experience their jubilee where their debts were written off and everything was restored to the way it was. But Jesus is our jubilee. And the Apostle Paul is reminding the, the Galatians here because just as, just as what happens in the current church, what, God doesn't just tell us what happens. He tell us what, tells us what always happens. And when people get hungry for the word of God and they're wanting to grow in his grace and his knowledge, then people start to creep in and they start adding new rules to follow. It's boggled my mind sometimes interacting with folks through the years that they could be hardcore living for the world, just full-on craziness. They get radically saved. And it's a miracle because some people are like, all of us are miracles, but there's just some hard nuts to crack. And they surrender their life to Jesus. And you're thinking, praise God, this is awesome. What a testimony. Like, big difference between light and darkness. But then, like, two weeks later, all of a sudden, they're telling you that you shouldn't have a Christmas tree, and why are you guys doing Easter egg hunt at church, and, um, and I can't believe you're having a hallelujah party, because don't you know that's the devil's day? And, and, like, somehow in 14 days, they went from this to knowing Jesus to hyper-religious over time, and my mind just goes, where does this come from? It comes from a scheme of the enemy to steal the word of God. And, 
because whenever time people are like, I just, there are people that, and there are people in here, all we want to do is glorify Jesus. More and more about Jesus. Just want to love the Lord, yield to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Like, if God says it, I want it. But we need to be rooted and grounded in the word. And sometimes people's passion to please God makes them susceptible to new rules if they're not anchored in the Word of God. Because there are things that sound good to the ear. And the Galatian church went through it. This church of idolaters, full of the futility of the world, come to know Christ, start following him. The Apostle Paul plants it, turns it over to an elder. As soon as it's turned over, the Judaizers come in and start going, well, actually, you know, the very first Christians were Jewish. You're like, yeah, that's true, because that's what they were working with. And they'll use methods to go, well, the first Christians were Jewish, and if you guys are going to be Christians that are Gentiles, you should become Jewish first. And then you get to become Christians. And if you're going to be Jewish, there are certain steps you need to take. Like people start talking that step, I'm not signing up for it. Can you say amen? Just not. Just not. And the thing is, it still happens today. Of going like, I am not going back to something that's already been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Because the Apostle Paul reminds us of this. For in Christ, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. Because it's not about a circumcision of the flesh, it's a circumcision of the heart. So when even some friends, that they get on a soapbox of this, there's a couple things I can do. I can either engage, and sometimes I want to. Like, when, when, you've, when you've dove into the Word of God and you've got all these things in your tool belt and you just want to go, <sighs> here it is. It's, like when, you know, it's almost like when the Mormons or the Jehovah's Witness show up on your door and you're like, yeah, we're ready to go. Let me, and then we beat them up with the Word of God and how... How effective is that? It makes us feel good for the moment. But then we, then we get alone in our prayer time and God goes, was that my heart for that person? Did I want you to assault them verbally? And Well, no. Because at the end of the day, I want to win hearts, not arguments. There's a part of me that wants to go tit for tat. But I also know this, it takes, it takes a lot of energy. And it's really tough to convince a person against their will. And the best thing I can do is pray that they'd get a revelation and an understanding of the new creation reality in Christ. That Christ didn't come so that we can fulfill something. He came so that we could walk in the New Testament, not to fulfill an old covenant. For in Christ, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. Truth is, we got to find a new path. Just as we're talking about the pathways in our brains, it's not just a pathway in our brain, but it's a new pathway of life. The evidence of a spirit-filled life is a changed life. If knowing... If, we, if you do a comparative to your life before Jesus and after Jesus and there's little to no discernible change, then I have to question the validity of your encounter with Jesus. Because the evidence of a spirit-filled life is a changed life. Because we're trying to walk out this new man. Can you say amen? There are certain desires, there are certain things that we are separate ourselves from. Like, what are they? What are those desires? Well, that's what somebody would want when they want a list of things to do and not do. This is what to do. 
follow Jesus, get to know him, love his word, learn, develop, listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. And then when he convicts, make a change. A new path. I brought this up earlier. Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. This has been a, a, a scripture that we've taught the kids, and especially on Wednesday night. This was a theme of our Wednesday night for years, that thy word is a lamp into my feet and a light into my path. And over the years of meditating on it, what, what it's really brought to me, brought to the forefront to me is this, is that, that the faith that God gives me at the minimum is to take the next step. That what he's promised me in his word is that he's going to illuminate enough for me to take the next step. And I might not always know the, the 20 year, the 15 year, the 10 year, the five year, the three month plan, everything that I really want in my mind. God's not always gonna unfold everything, but this is what I know, that if I take each step and I walk the path of the just, the path of faith, which is thy word is lamp unto my feet and light unto my path. And if I take enough of those steps in a row that's in line with the word of God, in line with the will of God, he is going to get me to the right place. Amen. Where I make divine appointment, where I meet divine appointments and develop glorious connections that are critical in our walk with Jesus. There are glorious connections in this place that have sustained me through the years. Can you say amen? Glorious connections. We were able to honor one of my glorious, one of our glorious, our, our glorious connections in Pastor Al and Patty this last Sunday. It's, it's a glorious connection. I mean, the, the, the the friendships developed over time, the, the, the interactions, the love, the care, the concern, like the bonds that a glorious connection make. It, and to me, it's in lines with, with as, much as, as much as my biological family. Like there are glorious connections in this place that if I have a, an aunt or a cousin or a distant uncle go through something like I've, I feel like it's not like I'm rejoicing, but it doesn't impact me like as much. It's like that stinks. I'm sorry it happens. We're going to pray for you. I have compassion. But that connection isn't as tied to some of those connections in this place. And when our kids are hurting, when your kids are hurting, I'm hurting with you. When your sons and daughters or older kids are going through it, you're having a health crisis, like man, it, it impacts us as pastors. Those are the things that keep us up late at night and wake us up early in the morning. And it's like, why do you wake up at five o'clock in the morning? Well, because there's things on our mind and I'm just, I can either lay there and scroll through my phone or I can get up and get something in my belly and I can start to pray. And I can pray about my friends that are, that are sick in their body or that are struggling in their home or my friends that come to mind that God brings to mind that just, God just bless them. Just, God, take care of them. Be their shield and defender. Be their safe harbor. God, guide them in their way. Speak to them, Lord. Like th Those are the things. And when you're making glorious connections, they, it goes beyond just, oh, we're, we're a nice little happy family community. It goes, no, it, it, it's something that the Holy Spirit unites us together. And it's because we're following one path on the same path. We're each walking our course. We're following a path. And, and to start to walk out this brand new man, it means sometimes we have to start our journey on a new path. Because the old path leads to old playgrounds, old play friends, old play friends, play things, 
that God's delivered us from. So we got to get on a new path. New path is this, Proverbs 4 and 18, I'll close with this one. The path of the just is like the shining sun. It shines even brighter until the perfect day. King James says, the full orb day. The brightest day. The perfect day. The path of the just is like the shining sun that shines brighter and brighter until that full orb day. If we're going to walk out being a brand new man with a new mindset, let's find a new path. Can you say amen? Pastor Jim, you want to close us in prayer, please? down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every thought that would try to exalt itself against the true knowledge of God. Lord, as new creation realities in Christ Jesus, I just thank you right now that you've given us your word to, to help tear down. For the word of God is powerful, it's alive, sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, joints and marrows, a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Because of this, Lord, we thank you that as we renew our minds to your word, Lord, uh, you, the Holy Spirit, working in our lives, begins to dismantle thoughts and things that uh, are not pleasing to God and don't exalt Jesus in our lives, but also keep us down and keep us hindered from uh, reaching that, that pinnacle that God has for every one of us. Thank you, Lord, that your word is powerful. Thank you, Lord, that the Holy Ghost is working on us. And we give you all the glory. Praise and honor. Bless everybody as they leave here tonight. Lord, make them mindful on a daily basis that Jesus Christ is their King and their Lord. And we just want to serve Him and follow Him all the days of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you all. We'll see you at 10 o'clock Sunday morning. Don't forget, Sunday night we have our baptismal out at Beulah Pool at 7 o'clock. So you don't want to miss that.